Hello everyone, this is Carolise, and if you're new to my channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the channel where I share tips and techniques on business analysis where you can learn things that you can actually apply right away in your job as a business analyst. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you so much for listening and please share the podcast with your friends so they too can learn the techniques I'm going to share on this podcast. If you're on YouTube, please like and please subscribe. I need subscribers, so please subscribe. I will appreciate it, okay? And if you're new to my channel again, watch some other videos I have. There's lots of information here on Agile, on Waterfall, um, different techniques, you know, just how to do the business analyst job well, I share that information with you. And of course, please check out our website, carolise.com, where you can get more resources as well. So today we're talking about something very, very important. Okay. Something very, very, like very, very important. And that is writing user stories. We're going to get into it today, guys. We're getting into it because people are struggling to write user stories. Okay. People are doing whatever they can, but it doesn't mean that what they're doing is actually very efficient. And so they're just stumbling through it and uh yeah there's a lot of stress <laughs> related to <laughs> user stories both from what the business analyst is doing sometimes the product owner themselves and even the developers and engineers who have to contend with what we're throwing over the wall <laughs> as user stories it's sometimes not in the best format and sometimes we just have no idea what we're doing. Okay, so writing user stories is very crucial if you're in an IT uh, environment, if you're in, if you're an IT or a functional business analyst, you gotta know how to write user stories because most companies are going agile. So if you're in a waterfall environment, you can escape it for now, but the majority of people are switching to agile and you're gonna have to learn to write user stories if you're gonna work in agile. Okay, so let's get into it. Are you ready? Let's go, let's get to work, let's get to work. Okay, so before I jump into Jira and explain to you how to write the user story, by the way, there's the window has a bright light and I wish I could like cover it up or something, but it's a little annoying to me, but never mind. let's get back to what we're talking about. So <laughs> the light coming through the window is just a little distracting. I thought of turning my camera the other way, but it was just too much. I gotta move everything behind me here. I, I'm, I'm, it's too much. So you're gonna have to live with that, okay? And I will too, okay? So let's get back to what we're talking about, which is the user stories. So let me first explain the value of the user story because sometimes I find that understanding where we're coming from and ending up here will really be a very good help for you to know why it's so important for us to write good user stories. Now, as I said in that video I did about the Agile um, process, I think I have a video here, I'll put it up here about Agile. If you want to understand the whole backdrop of why Agile came about, what it's about, you can watch that video. It's, I explain it. it's an older video, um, but it has the same good information that you'll find useful. So the user story is one of the most important artifacts from the agile process it's really just how do you break up bigger features bigger functionality into smaller chunks that can be done and estimated and so that the developers can do pieces of the software at a time demo that so that we can confirm that this works before they move on to something else right so you don't want to be building the whole system and then after you build the system, you realize that this part is wrong and that part is wrong because this is wrong and the rest of it all is all wrong. And you just spent a year building it. You know how much money and time and energy that was if it's all wrong? So instead of doing all of that, what we're doing in Agile is we're building it small chunks at a time. And as soon as we finish with one small chunk, we demo, we confirm it's correct, we test, good. We move on to the next one. Demo, correct, it's test, move, do the next one. So it's really breaking up this big functionality into smaller chunks so that we can confirm that it's correct and we can make sure it's working and we can have something to show at the end of the small 
time frame that we're building for and those time frames are called sprint if you're in a scrum environment so the value of the user story is to help the developers to know what to build and help the QA to know what to test for. It's really written for the testing, really, as opposed to even the building, because you have to know how to test it, and in order for you to test it, it has to be built, right? So it's written from a testing perspective. And it's the reason why it has this particular structure is that in the past, people would just build things because it was a great idea. It sounded good. It was like, you know, this is cool. We should have this and this was great. We should put that in there. And then you end up with a scope that was completely too much and you build things that nobody uses. Look at your word. Word is a great example. I like to use word. Word is a wonderful text editing tool. I'll use many parts of it, but there are some things in word I never ever touch, like never. Right, but it's there and I'm sure there's somebody who's using it, but it's not the most used feature. And, and so they may have spent millions of dollars building all of these additional things into Word that very few people use. So really, was it worth it? I don't know. If you're maybe a publisher and you need to do all these fancy things, fine, maybe using everything in Word, but very few people use everything that's there. So it's just, you know, how do you make sure you build what's needed what the users actually want that has a value to them and that is the reason why we structure the user story the way we do where it says as a user or as a type of user i want some functionality to get some benefit okay because you need to make sure that whatever you're doing has a benefit you're not just doing stuff to do stuff so when you're writing your user stories and you leave off the so that part Hello, like, why, why did you do that? As a type of user, I want the functionality and you're done. Why? Like, what's the benefit to the user? Why did you do this? Why are you building it? It's important to put the so that because you're going to force yourself to think through, okay, why are we doing this again? Like, how does the user actually benefit from this? And if you're finding it, you're struggling to find a benefit, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Okay. And so, the way you write your user stories is always a reflection of what the value is. What, what is the value? How are you making sure that this thing that you're building is actually going to help, going to be used? It's going to help someone in whatever they're doing and help someone in their process, in their day-to-day -day job. Like, what's the value of what you're doing? Okay? So that's the first part, getting the user story part correct. The next part is where people just are all over the place. They stumble and fumble and write all kinds of crazy stuff. Some things are too vague, some things are too detailed. It's a crazy mess. The acceptance criteria. The acceptance criteria has to be a part of your user story. And the acceptance criteria is written from the perspective of how are you gonna test for this? It's written from a testing perspective, right? So you need an acceptance criteria in your user story. Hello? Hello, what kind of user story doesn't have acceptance criteria? Uh-uh, 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 okay? In my course, I'll go into depth about this, but really and truly, the acceptance criteria needs to be numbered, okay? Just number them. It's very easy to number. <laughs> this job is not rocket science. If I can do it, you can do it too, okay? Number your acceptance criteria. Because when you put bullet points, it just makes it hard to refer to, and if you have a number of bullet points, the developers, the engineers are going to have to figure out what they are. They have to go through each of them. And it's just easy to refer to number five as opposed to bullet seven. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just put a number. It's so easy. Jira makes it very easy to do that. So you put the numbers for them and you need to put the word acceptance criteria because the block of text within that acceptance criteria is what you're committed to have built what you're committing for the QA to go and test. If it's in the comments, it's in your chat, it's in some other documents, they don't have to build it. You need to make sure wherever the conversation is happening, it all comes back to your JIRA acceptance criteria. I mean, if you're not using JIRA, that's fine. You could be using something else, but I'm just saying whatever tool you're using, the acceptance criteria needs to be very well defined there. And you don't want your acceptance criteria to be verbose and lengthy and convoluted and like, oh my God, no. 
your acceptance criteria, like your atomic requirements. I have a video on writing requirements and I give you examples of good and bad requirements in there. It's kind of the same thing. Your acceptance criteria is not a requirement. It's, it's, it, it can be, but it's not the same as your business requirement. There's some nuances there that's different. So I have a video on that too, somewhere, I'll put it somewhere. But the acceptance criteria needs to be just very clear. It needs to be just as the minimal words that you need as possible. You don't need to explain nothing in here. You don't need to have an argument in here. You don't need to convince anybody of nothing in here. You've already had that conversation, okay? Right now, you're just telling them, go do this. Go test for this. And you need to make sure you write it so clearly that it's obvious what it is. It's very clear. And if you need to clarify further, you can have indentations. So you put bullet points in your indentations. That's fine. So you need to make sure you have those. And your acceptance criteria shouldn't be more than 12 the most. Like I have a video talking about acceptance criteria and stuff like that. But I really think when you get into the teens, your user story is way too big. They're not going to be able to size this thing. And if they even size it, it's going to be huge. And they're going to have to ask you to go split it up anyway. So don't make too many acceptance criteria um, in, in one user story. It's just not good for the team. They need to work on small chunks at a time. They need to be able to understand the story well enough to estimate the story. And so you don't want it to be completely too big. You can always have notes in your user story. So you have your user story definition like the, as a user so-and-so, and then you have the acceptance criteria block, and then you can have notes below because sometimes you're having discussions with your team and they have some technical things to note about that particular story. Maybe they need to do something in the back end to facilitate the story or whatever. So you can put notes there, right? And that's literally it. Now you can embed designs into your, uh, your, your user stories. No, you can embed based on whatever tool you're using. If you use Zeppelin, for example, you can embed Zeppelin designs in there. I don't know if your company is using Sketch or whatever. There could be apps that allow you to embed, as, at least in Jira, there are apps that allow you to embed the designs into the actual user story so that you don't have to be copying and pasting screenshots everywhere. Okay, so you can look into doing that. So that's really how you have your user story written. You have it in the block that explains what it is, the acceptance criteria block, the notes, and you embed your designs or you attach your designs or whatever the documents you need to attach. Okay, it's not rocket science. Let's jump into Jira and let's see an example. Okay, so here we are in Jira and I've just created this one story, but before I talk about the story, let me show you what we're gonna be solving for. So pretend that you work for Atalation and they own Trello, okay? And Trello is the software that I covered in another video on software tools. It's a software for, you know, task management and so on. So people use Trello now to kind of organize themselves and then they push the tasks to Jira as a ticket. So we're not gonna worry about that right now. I'm just gonna give you a way, like a quick example of how to write user stories with a new functionality in Trello. So let's look at this screen. Let's say that you work as a business analyst and you're working for Trello and they decide that they're going to introduce this new feature called Workspace, right? And so you've, you know, you've done all the elicitation, the ten, you know, the technical discussions, you've had all the discussions that you need to have. And at the end of the day, the UX designers have designed for you uh, what the screens need to look like based on your um, discussions that you've had. And this is what they gave you, right? So they gave you the screen and say, okay, this is the best user experience that we want for people who want to use works space and of course it has it's a paid feature there's a trial um it has a prompt at the top to ask them to start you know start the the trial and it has its own tab and there is almost like a wizard to help them get started that's the first empty screen for you know using the the workspace they also give you another screen 
um, this one. Let me pull that one in and remove this one. For those of you on the podcast, I'm trying to explain what it looks like. <laughs> but I'm sure if you watch the video for this, you'll probably um, enjoy it more. But I'll try my best, okay? So the other screen that you have to work with is editing the name of your workspace. So you could put in a name field. Uh, workspace type field, short name, the website and description fields, and that will rename your existing workspace. So we're going to stop with those two for now, just to give you a flavor for how you write the user story. So pretend that this is all you get. So after you've done your elicitation, the designers went off, they did what they did. You know, you had discussions about the design, the user experience. And at the end of the day, this is what the, the entire team agreed to um, that they're going to implement, right? And now it's your turn to write the user stories for these so that the development team, your engineers can go off and build it. How do you do this? That's what we're going to be doing right now, okay? Now, I want to caveat everything by saying that you typically don't write your user stories solely based on screens. It's really based on the workflow. So if something is across different screens, that's okay. Um, don't break it up only because of screens because that can get you in some trouble. In this example, because it's so simple, it is broken up by screens, but just a caveat by saying that's not always the case, okay? So I've created this first story, which is add workspace to Trello homepage. And this story is going to be basically having that new tab in the homepage or that new section in the homepage and what that needs to be. Sorry guys, the wind is blowing outside and it caused my door to slam, so hope you didn't hear that. I'm gonna create another story for editing. So edit workspace uh, data. Okay, there could be other stories for creating the workspace and for the, the wizard to prop up and for showing the banner that says, you know, start your trial, we could do all that, but I'm not gonna make this this video too, too long. So here we are, we have these two stories. Let's work on how we would write the user, the, uh, user story and the acceptance criteria for this. So I like to use the full view um, in Jira. Jira does not enforce the way you should write your user story. It doesn't do that. You can create a template and you could use a template as your structure, but Jira as itself, it just has a text, a description box really. And you can put whatever you want in there. So it doesn't force you to write the user story in the way it should be written. One more thing I wanna say about the user stories is that I've seen people write the actual label of the user story to be the phrase as a user so-and-so. You want to make sure that the user story can easily be understood um, just looking at the backlog. In this example, I don't have a lot of stories in the backlog because this is a whole new project. But you want to make the user story label here um, very easy to spot and to know what it's about. Okay, so this is not where you actually write the formatting and the acceptance criteria for sure. You, you name it what the story is about. And then when you get into it, that's when you start using this section, this description section in Jira to describe your user story, okay? So let's go. It could be as, let's start with as a user, right? I want to, uh, this is the ad workspace. I want to create a workspace so that so that what i mean i haven't spent much time really figuring out what the workspace is i just know it's a way to organize so it looks like it's just a way for you to group your boards based on something common like based on some logical format right so that's really what it's about so let's put that in here as a user i want to create a workspace so that i can group my boards um, uh, logically or organize my boards. Maybe I'll do that so I can organize my boards better. Maybe I'll do that. Okay. And again, you're going to do it to be responsive to your particular project. That's your user story. That's your user story. Now your acceptance criteria. So you put acceptance criteria. Okay. 
And again, Jira doesn't enforce you to do any structure. They give you a wide open, you know, description text box and you can do whatever you want. Doesn't mean you should do whatever you want. You should do the structure that is recommended. And this is the structure. Now you can do user stories. Uh, I mean, the acceptance criteria in two different ways. You could say, given that I am on the home page of, uh, of the, of the board, I will be able, then I could be able to see the option for ad workspace. You could do it that way. Like a, a given, um, scenario, then action kind of setting, um, kind of structure. You could do that way, or you could do it. Um, basically it doesn't really matter how you write it in terms of the format at this point, it just needs to be very clear, right? So if that makes it clearer, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you tell the developer, the tester, where you're starting from, right? So that they know where, where should this test start? And so let's say you have your number here. I'm going to do it, um, just my way, which is normally to say, like when, you know, the user is on the home page, they should, um, a new workspace tab will be shown. Now this is assuming that we already handled the first time login scenario where the first time you log in, it's going to prompt you to create a workspace. That's not this ticket. This is the ability for you to add a new workspace. So again, you have to know how to separate your tickets. I'm not going to go through all of that right now. Um, so let's do that. So when the user is on the home page, a new workspace tab will be shown. Okay. Or the system shows a new workspace tab. We could say that the system will show. new workspace tab okay let's do it that way okay when the user clicks on workspace tab they should uh or they will get an option to create a new workspace now, why am I saying an option? If you look at the, the screenshot here and you go to workspace, um, it is asking you actually to start the free trial. Um, so we could handle that. We could say when, if, when the user goes on the workspace tab, if they're not, if they're not a paying member yet, then they'll see the option to start their free trial. Let's do that because otherwise it's assuming that you're gonna always see it and that's not the case. So let's leave this for now because this might be when you've already paid for it. I don't have that screen because I haven't paid for it. So let's do um, the check. So, so if the logged in user has not subscribed to the paid version of Trello, then the system will show a message that says, says you could either repeat what the message says or you could you know refer them to the screenshot because sometimes you don't really want to make your user story so coupled to the screenshot that any change on the screenshot you got to go redo the whole user story okay so um but in this case i think it's a standard thing start 14 day trial free trial and that would be um the way you do that so that says start 14 a free trial, right? And even though you've mentioned exactly what it needs to say, you can still say in bracket, you know, see mockup, right? Because you're going to attach the mockup in a minute. Now, how to handle the free trial signing up would be a separate ticket. So in this case, you could say, um, this is where the notes can come in. So you could say in the notes, functionality for signing up for free trial handled in story, I don't know, RW, sorry, CS, uh, 
three or whatever. Whenever we create it, then that would be what we put there. And this could be a link, but I haven't created it yet. So I'll create it later and link it later. So that's just a note so we can know that that happens because you don't want your user story to become too convoluted. So you don't want to embed in here the whole free trial, sign up and all that functionality. It's, it's, it's too, too much. This story is about adding workspace. All you're doing here is adding a workspace. You're not doing free trial, sign up, you're not doing anything else. So functionality for signing up for free trial handling story so and so. I'm gonna change this and make it a link, but I'll do that after in a minute. So um, if the logged in user has not subscribed to the paid version of Trello, then the system will show a message that says start 14 day trial and then um, see mockup. And then, you know what, maybe I'll put it right here. See mockup functionality, because sometimes you're reading it, you wanna make sure you see the relevant note where it makes sense, I'll put that. So if the user is subscribed um, to workspaces, then, and then this is where this would make sense, then when the user clicks on the workspace tab, they will get an option to create a new workspace, right? Um, creating a new workspace, will include and then you're gonna itemize all these things maybe the name of the workspace i don't have a creation screen but i have this is name workspace type short name website and description okay so let's do that name workspace type short name description okay cool and let's see what else is here. There's optional in bracket for website. Oh, I didn't put website. So optional for website and for description. Let's do that. Short name, website. God, I can't spell today. Website and optional. Okay. And optional. So creating a new workspace will include the following fields. Let's make that clear. The following fields, okay? You're watching this live, guys, so <laughs> you're seeing my process live. All right, so creating a new workspace will include the following fields, name, workspace type, short name, website, optional, description optional. Now you haven't said what type of fields these are, I mean, you could you could leave that out because if you look at the, you know, if you look at the screenshot, the developers can say what this is. But you know, sometimes you want to make sure that you handle certain things. So, for example, the name field is a text field. Well, what about the length? Is this going to be a standard length? So maybe you could say name, and under name you could say text field with. Um, maybe unlimited characters. I don't know if that's the best practice, but anyway. Or if, it, if it's a maximum of 80 characters or 120 characters, you put that in, right? So, you know, it's just a way for you to tell them exactly what they need to know. Workspace type, and that looks like a drop down field. So let's do that drop down field uh, with options for, I don't really. Ooh. I didn't know Jira did that. You put a colon and Jira brings up smiley faces. <laughs> Jira is crazy. All right, so let's look and see. Um, we, I don't know what the options would be. It's it's defaulting to other. Actually, I went and took a look. So it's really the drop down options for the workspace is other. There's a bunch of options, including sales, you know, operations, you know, a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to do all of that right now, but you could list out all of these options right here. And then you could say other is the default. See how this is getting to be a little bit fleshed out right now? Huh? You think it was simple, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> so that's how you create your, your workspace. Now, once you've created the workspace with these fields, then the, the user will have an option to save. 
the user is able to save um, or cancel, right? Cancel will return the user to the uh, Trello home screen. Save will, well, save will, it should really prompt them to pick the board, right? I don't have it, so I don't know, because obviously I haven't paid for it. But imagine that this was not an edit. Imagine this was a create. You'd probably want to start prompting them to start picking their board so that they don't have an empty workspace. I'm going to assume that's what it does. So save will uh, basically take the user to the next step of the wizard through the um, next step of the setup wizard and prompt them to select boards for the workspace. Now you could include in here as another acceptance criteria that they pick a board and the board is assigned to the workspace or it could be that there's a separate story that handles assigning boards to workspace because I don't know if there's any criteria around which board if the board needs to have certain settings if the members of that board needs to be also members of the workspace I don't know what the functionality is again I just literally picked <laughs> I picked a software and picked a feature and decided to use it as, a, as an example in this uh, video. So I'm not going to get too bogged down in all of that. I'm going to stop here for now. But you get the picture, right? You get what, you get the point I'm making, right? You want to write your stories to be something like this, okay? And of course, what you do here, you save it, obviously, because you don't want it to go away. And then you would attach now... Um, look at all my beautiful pictures. <laughs> so as soon as you're done with this and you've saved it, then the next thing you do is you attach your um, screenshots. But if you have an app to let you embed, you could do that as well. I have this embed, this app here, but I, it works with Figma. But I'm not, I don't have this design in Figma, obviously, because <laughs> I just, I'm using it for an example here. But in this case, you could just put the Figma link in here and it would update and embed the, 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 the mockup, the UX design, so that as they change it in Figma, I would see the change and have, not have to come in here and remove the old screenshot and add the new screenshot. The same for Zeppelin. I haven't done the Zeppelin app yet, but there is a way to get Zeppelin in here. And you could see the Zeppelin files in there. I think there are quite a few other ones that help you to see the, the, the mock-ups, the designs from your designers into your user story. So I'm just going to go attach the screenshot for now because that's what I have. Okay, cool. So I have attached it. And again, it's not 100% exact because the one I've attached is really editing. It's not the one for creating. That's because I don't have the real thing, but it's okay. You get the picture. So this is what it would look like in Jira. They'll look at it. They say, oh yeah, this is what Carlis is talking about. Boom. They close it. They go back. They read the acceptance criteria. They look at the screenshot. Then they start going in, in here and start story pointing. We talked about this ticket being done in a different one, this functionality ticket. So let's go create that one real quick and then let's add it and see See how we link those two things together okay so I like to create it from the backlog but you could always go here to create and then say story and this one would be hand um, it's more like sign up um, maybe I'll say allow sign up of free trial for workspace I don't know if there's a free trial that includes workspace like if you just have a free trial for something else workspace is included but i'll just assume that workspace is its own thing and you sign up for the trial for that by itself you could write your user stories in here but again i just like to use it to write it um um in the big screen so it jira pops up oh i missed it <laughs> jira would normally pops up and you can click on that link 
Let's go back to the backlog. You'll see it in the backlog. So allow sign up a free trial. Click on that. Click on the link to open it in a new tab. And now you can go and do it all over again. So let's just say that as a user, I want to sign up for a free trial of Workspace so that, so that what? I can test it before I buy, right? Or something like that. And then acceptance criteria. Uh, maybe, I mean, how does free trials work, right? Normally you'd say um, user, maybe you start off with when the user clicks the link, the option, because it could be a link or a button, to sign up for a free trial of workspace the system will display um the option to enter credit card information the user well i would say maybe this the free sign up screen because that screen might have more than just credit card so let's do this free sign up screen the user will see um text describing the free sign up because normally they have like verbiage around you know how long it's when it's gonna start and end and what you're gonna get with it and i basically trying to persuade you to do the sign up i'm not gonna go through all of that because that's outside the scope of this video um and let's assume that it's there and then you could just say maybe see mock-up let's assume that we have a mock-up with all that text in there so you don't have to repeat it right here and then the user is able enter their credit card information um system will validate credit card using the credit card api i don't know if we have one but you know it would be a separate ticket if we didn't have one right uh, and I say ticket loosely, it really means it's a story. And then blah, blah, blah. Okay. So because remember, um, testers are going to need to know where to look to find what. So you need to put where the ticket is if already there. Or if it's something that we already do, like we already handle payment processing somewhere else, you don't have to recreate the whole payment processor again. We already do it. So you could say... Let's say we already have it because I don't want to make it too complicated here. I would say system will validate a credit card using the credit card API that it uses today. You know, if this is an ex um, existing functionality and that should be enough for the developers and testers to know what to go test and write the code for. Um, once the credit card is validated, the card details is stored and will be charged at the end of the trial and the user uh again once card is validated the user is returned to the workspace home screen banner for scroll down Banner for trial will no longer display on the screen. Okay, so that could be an example of how this um, this ticket could go, right? So we're going to save that. I like to clean up a little bit. I like to have my acceptance criteria. Sorry, my dog's going off. I like to have acceptance criteria bold because I like it to stand out, right? And I save it here. So yeah, that's my ticket on allowing the sign up of the free trial. So now we can go back to the other story that we were looking at. Uh, which one was it? It was adding this one. So CS1. So on that story, now where we have handled in 
XXX, I can go back and clean it up and say, well, now I know it's story it's a handle in. So I can go um, just kind of link the issue. Uh, link issue. In this case, you could say relates to. Um, do I want to have depends on? It doesn't depend. Well, being able to add. Let's see, being able to add a workspace would need you to have either the paid version or the trial. So it's not depends on, depends on feels like it must have trial. It may not be that you have a trial, it may just be that you have the paid version. So I'm not gonna put depends on, I'm gonna say relates to, and then you find the ticket and I'm gonna call, I think it's called CS3. Yeah, and that's what we're gonna link. And now it's linked right here, but that's not really what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was put it here. So CS-3. Sometimes Jira would convert this into the actual ticket. I don't know. I might be doing it wrong, but it normally would convert itself. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I don't know. Let's save that, see what happens. Hmm. Handles in... How do I get it to be a link? Let's see. Maybe this is how I do it. Yeah, there we go. So you use a link inside the text, not the link issue. The link issue is a different thing. Oh, okay. So now it's a link. It's still, it's still not perfect because sometimes it changes it, but I don't know. It's not doing that right now. I'm not going to worry about that. So anyway, so the point here is that you have your acceptance criteria. It's numbered properly. It's indented where it needs to be indented. It's not too big. It's easy to size. It covers the feature or the functionality that is described in the title of it. We've attached our screenshots and we have linked an, an, an associated ticket so that the, the testers can know what to go look at, okay? That is how you write your user stories. I could do the other ones um, that's in the backlog here. Uh, this one about editing the workspace data, but I'm not going to do that. It's so similar to the adding that I'll just, I'll just leave that out for now. But the point I'm trying to show you is you need to write these stories to be very clear and very uh, to the point. Now, I'm sure if I read this again, because I'm not even reading it and I'm just glossing over it. If I were to go back and read this again, there may be some wording I might tweak, I might clean up. And this is the reason why you have your grooming sessions and you have your sprint planning so that other eyes can be on there and they can help you to refine it. But you want to be the one who is doing it so well just from the get-go that there really isn't much to do when, when you go to your grooming or your planning session, right? So Sometimes when I write the stories, I take a break, you know, the next day I come back, I look over them again because you might miss something. That's fine. But you really want to make sure it's structured like this. You don't want this area here, this text box that says description. You don't want this to be convoluted. Don't be like putting screenshots in here and bullet points here and, you know, a long paragraph over here. It's That's too hard for anyone to look at and make sense of right away to estimate, okay? Okay. Make your user stories somewhat like this, uh, numbered to the point. You can put your notes in here. You know, maybe there will be something technical that the technical team might need to say. You know, maybe there is, you know, some dependencies. Who knows? Whatever you can put as notes, you put it in there. And you attach your screenshot so you could see it like this. And that's how you do it, okay? That is how you do it. Okay, so there you have it. That's how you write a user story, okay? I want you guys to become business analysts, rock stars. That means you're going to go out there, you're going to do your best, you're going to go to the team sprint planning, and you'll be like, this is the user story, and they'll be like, whoa, whoa, this is clear, whoa, this is good, this is so clear, this is so to the point, I understand exactly what I need to do, let me just go size this right now and move on to the next story. Okay, the stories have to be easy to understand. You got to use very simple language and you need to make sure it's understandable. It's not too vague. They shouldn't be going off and trying to figure out what are they supposed to build. Your user story is going to knock it out the park and you're going to get it right because you're going to spend the time understanding the use case, doing your elicitation, 
understanding what you need to build, and then you're going to write it in a very clear, succinct way that your team can understand because you are a business analyst rock star. Okay? Okay? <laughs> Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please, please, please like the video, okay? And subscribe to this channel and go check out my other places where I, I post, such as my Facebook, etc. okay? Thank you guys so much. I thoroughly appreciate you, and I will see you guys next time.